Um, continuing on with our discussion on the Vietnam War and its relationship to what Philip Caputo has to write about, um, I want to turn our attention to a new topic, and that is how the war is being fought. Now, we can understand that uh, ever since 1947, when Harry Truman promised that America would stand up to communist expansion and we would not back down, um, we would implement whatever needed to be done to stop the spread of communism, uh, part of that meant going in and actually fighting wars. We saw that with Korea, and now we're seeing with Vietnam. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why we were there. Um, if you will open your big blue book, your Documents for America's History, open it up to 363. And on that page, you're going to see a document written by the then President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Um, the document is entitled, Peace Without Conquest. And what he talks about in there, this is a speech that he made uh, in front of Johns Hopkins University in 1965, in the early stages of the war. But what he's doing is he's outlining why we're there. Okay? And if you read through 363 and on to 364, read that thoroughly. Uh, I recommend that you do that. But what you're going to find is instances where he actually justifies America's involvement in Vietnam. He says that we're there because we had a promise to keep. We promised Vietnam ever since 1954 that we would stand up for freedom and democracy, and that's what we're doing by sending in the ground troops, uh, standing up for freedom and democracy. Uh, he says that we're there to strengthen the world order, that, that we're, we're there to provide stability, that we're providing um, uh, uh, predictability within the government, and we're restoring the government into the hands of the people. He talks about being there to stand up to the aggressors of the world, and predominantly he's referring to China. But more than anything else, I think what you'll come away with when it, when it comes to that document is we're, we're basically there to I I ensure a, a peaceful existence for the, the people in Vietnam. Now, Philip Caputo has talked about those issues to some extent, not in great length, but he notes that part of the reason that he enlisted in the Marine Corps was to defend the world from communist expansion, that they were the new bad guys, and John Kennedy and later on uh, Lyndon Johnson had, had made this pledge to the rest of the world that America would be their knight in shining armor and defend it from communist domination. You really have to ask yourself, though, if this is the nature of our mission, then why are we fighting the Vietnam War in the, in the manner in which we're fighting it? Now, for those of you that have been coming to lecture and have been following closely as far as how the war is being fought, you know, one of the prime tactics that the American um, ground forces use when it comes to rooting out the bad guys is going into the jungle, um, finding as many Viet Cong as they possibly can and killing as many as they possibly can. And then they go back to base and the next day or the next week they turn around and have to do the same thing. The Secretary of Defense at the time was a man named Robert McNamara. And as it comes to be, as it comes to be found out as the war goes on and on, more and more people are of the persuasion that Robert McNamara has designed a war of attrition. In other words, the way that we're going to defeat the spread of communism in Vietnam is we're going to kill as many of the bad guys as, as possible. And just so we're clear on this, the bad guys are not exactly identifying themselves. It's very difficult for American troops to find um, the difference between a friendly Vietnamese and an unfriendly Vietnamese. So that being the case, you know, Lyndon Johnson's pledge to stand up for freedom is, is, is a very difficult task considering how we're fighting this war. Now, I want you to consider what Philip Caputo has to say about it. So get, you out, get out your uh, Caputo texts. And I am in the middle of chapter 10, which in... Um, uh, the page number that I'm going to be referring you to is page 178, uh, and again, that's in chapter 10. But it's several pages deep for everyone else with, a, um, with, with another uh, 
with another edition. The place where I'm going to start us out on page 178 begins with a paragraph that starts out with, maybe you could explain what we're doing over here. That's the opening line of a paragraph. Maybe you could explain what we're doing over here. Find that. You'll note that Philip Caputo is sitting down for lunch, and he's having a conversation with the chaplain uh, about the nature of the war. I mean, they're, they're discussing in this private conversation, you know, the topic that is under conversation between me and you right now. What, what is the nature of the war? What are we actually doing over here? What, what does this have to do with standing up to freedom and democracy? So anyway, the chaplain sits down and he says, maybe you could explain to me what we're doing over here. You've been a platoon commander. When we got here, we were just supposed to defend the airfield for a while and then go back to Okinawa in Japan. Now we're in the war to stay and nobody has been able to explain to me what we're doing. I'm no tactician, but the way it looks to me, we send men out on an operation, they kill a few VC, Viet Cong, or the Viet Cong kill them, and then we pull out and the Viet Cong come right back in. So we're back where we started. That's the way it looks to me. I think these boys are getting killed for nothing. Okay? Now, Caputo goes on, basically resigns himself. He says, I shrugged my shoulders, I threw up my hands and said, I'm just this second lieutenant. I'm no general. I, I have no control over how we're fighting this war. Or nobody's telling me why we're fighting it the way that we're fighting it. I'm just trying to execute my duties the, to the best of my ability. The chaplain pushes him a little bit further. Um, what Caputo says to some extent is we've only taken 84 casualties. Only 84 people have been shot, wounded, killed, whatever. And he says, that's not too bad. And the chaplain presses him on it and says, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And Caputo says, what I mean is that 12 KIAs killed in action in two months isn't bad. Ryerson, the chaplain, Ryerson's face reddened and his voice got strident. That's 12 wrecked homes. 12 wrecked homes, Lieutenant, he pointed a finger at me. 12 KIA is pretty bad for those families of those dead Marines. I didn't say anything. My food was getting cold in the tray. A few senior officers had turned around to see what the chaplain's outburst was all about. It's difficult to understand this from an American perspective, that 12 people that were killed in action um, for something that we really couldn't explain. We went into the jungle trying to find the bad guys, the bad guys killed our guys, and, and nobody can explain what the whole mission was about. Think about this in terms of how it's really obscuring making this nature of the war very abstract. We don't understand why we're doing what we're doing. Think about that from the Vietnamese perspective. Every day we go into the jungle, we shoot up the jungle, we tear apart homes. It's difficult to convince people that we're there to try to stand up to the bad guys because how do we look in the aftermath of all of this? We kind of look like the bad guys. I want you to flip the page over. It's the next page if you're in a different edition, but on my edition it's in page 179. There is a, um, there's a paragraph there in the middle of the page. It starts out, leaving the mess, I went back to my desk. Leaving the mess, I went back to my desk. It was difficult to work. The tent was stifling, and I felt confused. The chaplain's morally superior attitude had rankled me, but his sermon had managed to plant doubt in my mind doubt about the war. Much of what he had said made sense. Our tactical operations did seem futile and directed toward no apparent end. There were other doubts aroused by the events of the de that day, which, made, which had made a mockery of all the Catholic theology the Dominican and Jesuit priests had preached to me in high school and college. Man's body is temple of the Holy Spirit, man is created in the image and likeness of God, have respect for the dead. Well, the four temples in that trailer had undergone considerable demolition, and it was hard to believe a Holy Spirit had ever resided in them. As for there being the image and likeness um, of the deity, they were more the image and likeness of crushed dogs seen lying at the sides of highways, and we had not showed them much respect though they were the dead. I still believed in the cause of the war for which we were supposed to be fighting, but the kind of men we were, 
and what kind of army was it that made exhibitions of human beings it had butchered. So the, the way that I like to look at this is the, the message that we're, that, that we're sending out both to American society but also to the rest of the world is not the same message that people see on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to what's happening in Vietnam. Not only is it very difficult to understand, in some instances it almost seems to contradict each other. Um, you'll remember, I'm, I'm not going to make very specific reference to this, but you remember what Philip Caputo's job is during the middle part of this book, right? He calls himself the Officer of the Dead. Um, basically his job is to keep score of how many bad guys we killed and how many of our guys they killed. That's why he calls himself the Officer of the Dead. And part of his job is to display um, dead Viet Cong foot soldiers for these big wig uh, army officials that are, or actually they're, uh, I guess, marine officials that are coming in to tour, um, tour the airfield. So you can understand that we're supposed to be the good guys, uh, the same people that in World War II had liberated the concentration camps and kicked out the Japanese from the places they had conquered throughout the Pacific. And here we are displaying people that we had killed in battle. Um, very little respect for the dead and very little respect for the, the society in which we were supposed to be liberating and standing up for freedom. One last reference and then we're going to transition into a, another topic. In my book, we're on page 192 and this is about a page, maybe a page and a half into chapter 12. It's a run-on paragraph, uh, but it starts out, and this is about about eight lines from the top and to the right-hand side of the page. He's talking about the battles in which the Marines fought and the casualties in which they took. They came in twos and threes. Do you see that? It's toward the right-hand side of the page. They came in twos and threes, and that is how they died and how our own men died in twos and threes. We fought no great battles. There was no massive hemorrhaging, just a slow, steady trickle of blood drawn in a series of ambushes and firefights. It was increasingly difficult to, to see where all of this was going. And the longer and longer that the war drug on, and the more and more of these people that were killed in battle, although you don't, you don't have a Gettysburg or a Normandy or a Battle of the Bulge or anything like that, where you have just an overwhelming amount of casualties, what you've got is a steady reminder of the fact that people are being killed. And as it became more and more difficult to point out exactly why they were being killed, fewer and fewer people could agree with the war. And what I mean, and this is important, this is probably the most important part of this segment, as it became more and more difficult to explain why we were there, why we were fighting, and why people were dying, fewer and fewer people were able to say the ends justified the means. That's important. Uh, and that's something you should really consider. Fewer and fewer people were able to say, well, you know, we'll, we'll sacrifice ted, 10 dead Marines because we were able to push the communists out of um, Da Nang or were able to justify, you know, civilian casualties to the tune of hundreds, possibly even thousands of people in the northern part of South Vietnam because we were able to repel communist uh, aggression. Um, there, there was concrete, irrefutable, very, very clear evidence that we were winning. You don't have that in Vietnam. And as the war continues to drag out, it becomes increasingly unclear. That's where I'm going to leave this particular lecture. Now what we're going to talk about is the effect that this has on our fighting men.